I know that I hung on a windy tree nine long nights, wounded with a spear dedicated to Odin, sacrificed myself to myself on that tree of which no man knows its origin. No bread did they give me, nor drink from a horn. Downwards I peered. I took up the runes. Screaming, I took them, then fell back from there. What's up, witches? I'm back with another witchy-related video for you, finally. Today, I'm going to be doing a video all about how to use the runes. Now, to give a little bit of history and background on what we have come to know as the runes, the word rune itself comes from an old Norse or Germanic word, which means mystery or secret. And when we typically talk about runes in Norse paganism today, especially in terms of divination, we're talking about what's called the Elder Futhark set of runes. Futhark just basically means the equivalent of the alphabet as we know it today. In the case of the alphabet, the word is abbreviated from the first two letters of the Greek alphabet, alpha and beta alpha, beta, alphabet. And so similarly, Futhark is just kind of a abbreviated term for the six letters of the Elder Futhark. When we try to look at the origins of the Elder Futhark alphabet itself, it may have originated with an early culture that the Germanic tribes perhaps traded with, or adapted from an early Etruscan or Thracian set of letters by early Vikings who either worked with or for the Roman legions. So in this case, we're talking about either pre-Roman Etruscan alphabets, and the Etruscans were the people that lived in the northern part of Italy and up into the Alps. And then Thracian Greece was the part of Greece, like kind of outside the main peninsulas, like the upper, like northern portions. And if you're looking for some really rich, detailed, and informative scholarly videos on the origins of the runes and the Futhark alphabets, I highly recommend that you check out Dr. Jackson Crawford's channel and his videos. He has several videos really delving into the possible historical origins of the runes and the letters themselves. And in one of his videos that I watched, he also points out similarities between Futhark runes and lost alphabets of Alpine Gaul from circa 600 BC to 1 AD. And that's interesting to me because um, similarly the, how the Etruscan peoples lived in the northern portions of Italy and up into the mountains above the peninsula, these people also would have inhabited the region kind of known as like Transalpine Gaul to the Romans. So the peoples of these mountains and um, hills and these Germanic and Gaulish tribes. So it could have partially originated from within the peoples themselves and then was also possibly partially adapted from pre-Roman Greek and Etrus Etruscan alphabets. But the real question that we get into in paganism is, did it have its origin as a written language system or a magical rune symbol system or both? Now, while I did feature that portion from the Havamal at the beginning of this video where Odin talks about his discovery of the runes and how he came to find them, it must be known that we can't say for certain that these Futhark runes that we're going to be talking about in this video are the same runes that were said to be discovered and passed down by Odin, which he is talking about in the poem. In fact, another thing I want to point out before we get further into the Elder Futhark and its more divinatory aspects, it's also interesting that in a, another stanza of the Havamal, stanza 143, it said that Odin carved runes for the gods and for the Alfar, Dane. 
and Dvalin for the Dvergar, Asvider for the Jotun. I carved some myself. And this passage to me implies that there are more runes than just the runes given by Odin to mankind or the ones that he found and used for himself. Either each race of beings has their own set of magic or their own set of runes, or that Odin knows all of them, but we as humans or mankind were only given one small piece of that puzzle, which is very intriguing to me. So it implies that even if these Elder Futhark runes were the ones that Odin was talking about and that we think of when we think of magical runes, that there could be even more magical runes and symbols outside of just the 24 and the Futhark alphabet or just whatever, whichever ones that Odin discovered. So it seems that there are many different types of runes and that each race of beings, the dwarves, elves, and Jotun, all have their own different sets of runes and perhaps types of magic that they use. Now, when it comes to how we think of the runes today or using runes for divination, that is primarily based on the Old Norse or Anglo-Saxon rune poems. So whatever magical uses the Elder Futhark runes may have had in the times, and you know, Viking and pre-Viking times, are sadly lost to us. If they had any other uses just as a single rune being a magical symbol, we don't have any record really of that. So the meanings of the Elder Futhark runes, the, the 24 runes that we know in the Elder Futhark and as we use them today, are, what's the word for it? It starts with an R. Reconstructed. They're reconstructed from these old medieval poems. These Elder Futhark runes are typically arranged or grouped into three rows or groups called eight. Eight means not just, you know, a set of eight runes, but also means family or generation. So, so there are three eights or families or groups of runes within the 24 letters of the Elder Futhark. In 19th through 14th century medieval manuscripts written in Old English, Norwegian, and Icelandic, these were arranged in poetic stanzas, kind of giving a meaning or association with each rune. In Tacitus's Germania, if you've seen my video all about that, he does mention that they, the Germanic tribes had a process of marking symbols on pieces of wood and then using them for the drawing or casting of lots or fortunes, but we don't really know what those symbols looked like or what that process looked like or if those things that they carved would have in any way resembled the Futhark runes or what their meanings were, but we do know that some type of casting or divination was performed by these people. So while these modern divinatory meanings of the runes are largely reconstructed, there are examples of rune inscriptions on objects. And some of my um, sources and information here is also being taken from this book that I've had forever and ever and ever called The Runes Workbook by Leon D. Wilde. I have um, a 2008 edition here, and it is very useful in terms of getting to know the runes and giving some history and background, but as with everything, just be aware of your sources, check your sources. And, oh, how, how do I want to put this without delving too far into the whole here there be dragons territory that is Norse paganism. It's a good book but just be aware of your sources and who they cite as their sources. But in terms of just giving backgrounds and meanings and information about the runes themselves, it's definitely been a useful source. And in this book, in the history of the runes, it does make reference to examples of runic inscriptions on objects. So while we don't know that the Norse peoples or the Northern peoples used individual runes as symbols, we know that just as we would use the alphabet to write out spells or magical inscriptions today, that they did use this alphabet, or Futhark, to write in magical inscriptions and carve them on things. 
And one example of that is the Kragel spear shaft, which was discovered um, in Denmark and is believed to date to somewhere around 300 CE or Common Era. And it shows how runes were or can be used to increase the usefulness of objects or imbue them with magical properties. So we, while we don't have evidence that the runes were used as symbols individually or themselves, they were used to write both magical, uh, both mundane and magical inscriptions. And it's interesting to me, I'm possibly going to make a part two of this video where I delve more into the concept of like chanting runes or galder chanting as it's known and that these rune spear shafts include this interesting feature of like a triple gebo rune and that's possibly some type of galder chant or yeah um, powerful magical inscription just in my humble opinion but let's move on to the next part runes and divination you will find runes rune letters to read very great runes, very powerful runes, which Odin painted, and which the holy gods made, and which Odin carved. Stanza 144 in Havamal does list the following things that one should know how to do with the runes. You should be able to write, read, paint, test, ask, bless, send, and offer them. In modern practice, um, divination, in a sense, is kind of akin to the Norse practice of satyr, in my opinion, in that it involves reading or peering into the web of weird and trying to see the threads of fate, which are usually governed by the three primary norns. And it's interesting that the names of these three primary norns in Norse mythology are also references to time. Verdandi is the present because verda means something like to become, but more closely that which is becoming or is happening. The Norn erd is the past, aka word or fate. A closer meaning would be that which became, that which happened, that that which already has happened or can't be changed. And then we have Skuld, the Norn of the future, whose name may come from the, ro the root word Skulu, need or must be, aka that which needs to be or must happen. So when we're looking into this web of word or we're consulting the runes to try to divine things from it, we are looking into that which is already happening, the present. We are looking into the past, that which has already happened. And we are looking into that which must be or will be. So some basic methods that you can use if you're just getting into wanting to do rune readings or rune divinations is that you can begin each day by drawing a single rune, doing a single rune poll, and using that rune to focus on or just study and meditate on throughout your day, or using it as kind of a daily horoscope, as some people do. Or, like the past, present, future of the, which is the common tarot div divination setup, you can draw three runes for the three norns, past, present, and future. And an optional feature that you can do when rune casting and that which some people have incorporated as a part of heathenry is to use a white cloth for casting runes on as this is one thing which was referred to explicitly in Tacitus. But you don't you don't need a special cloth and it doesn't need to be a white cloth. So those are some easy things that you can do just to start out with, is just to do a single rune poll or a three rune poll. I haven't really myself delved much deeper than that right now just because there are 24 runes, each of which have their own very depths of meaning. <laughs> 
So I am definitely taking it slow and, and taking it in baby steps to just learn the runes and familiarize myself with them before I go doing too much with them divination or spell wise. But I will do another video, I think, where I talk about using runes in my more specifically magical or spell work applications as I use them. Some things that I wanted to also touch on before I wrap up this video to bring up the concept of the mythical blank rune, which is sometimes included in modern rune sets. And it's said to represent word or fate or the like unknown factors at play, almost like a wild card. But this is a, like I said, um, a, a modern creation. There was no like mystery rune or blank rune in the Elder Futh arc. So this is a more recent addition. I don't know when exactly it started being a thing, you may or may not find it in rune sets that you buy, or you may or may not choose to include it in rune sets that you make. Almost like the kind of superstitious way people talk about tarot decks and purchasing your first tarot deck, um, I don't think you need to be gifted your first set of runes per se, just like I don't think you need to be gifted your first set of tarot cards. But when it comes to the runes and familiarizing yourself with the Elder Futh's Ark, I will highly recommend making your own set, especially for a first set. And that's what I have done here. This is my very first set of runes. I did have a rune set way back in the day when I was in high school, like a baby Wiccan just getting into tarot and the occult and things like that. And I actually still do have the guidebook that came with that rune set. And the interesting thing about this guidebook is that it does use almost the more, I would say, Germanic spellings or pronunciations of some of the runes, which I hadn't seen before. Fehu is Feo, Wunjo is just Wun, Gift or Gebu is Geofu, Nathis is Nid, Perthro is Peorf. So I, I thought that was kind of interesting to note that this one kind of uses more Germanic versions. Back to what I was talking about, I highly recommend making your own first set of runes. That's what I did here and I just keep them in this very nice handmade leather pouch someone gave to me. And really all I did was go to the craft store and buy a bag of like smooth river rocks for like arts and crafts, maybe for like painting, painting rocks if you're into that kind of thing. And ooh, what did I pull? I pulled Fehu, Vanir Vibes, Rido, and Solo, the victory runes. But yeah, all I did was take these river rocks, these river stones, I spray painted them and then just used a gold paint pen to write the runes on just because I wanted something, um, A, like, yeah, that I feel like is a good way to not only familiarize yourself with the Elder Futh Ark, but to imbue your set of runes with your own energy and kind of tie them to you more closely. And with these, you know, I just wanted um, a really, I just wanted a really sturdy set of first rune stones that were just literal rocks so that I could, yeah, like throw them around and chuck them on the ground and do whatever I needed to with them and like not have to worry about them getting damaged. But I do at some point here need to perhaps get a smaller set of a more lightweight material. I uh, used Gebo in cold exchange. Cause this pouch do be heavy, y'all. Um, turns out, yeah, carrying around an entire bag of rocks is not very lightweight. So I do at one point want to get a smaller, more lightweight set, but I also highly recommend making your own first set of runes out of just whatever materials you can find. Do it the old-fashioned Germanic way, like Tacitus describes, where you just find a down a tree branch of the right diameter and saw some little wooden discs out of it, and you can write or wood burn the runes onto the face of the disc. Or I've also seen people actually cut just smaller sticks or staves, and you can carve or draw the runes on the staves and use them that way. So you don't have to go out and buy a set. I highly recommend making one just to help yourself learn the runes and to help imbue them with your energy and you can customize them to yourself. 
I'm gonna leave this video off there. Look out for a part two where I'll talk about magical uses of how I use runes and bind runes and spell work. And then maybe either in that video or a separate video, depending on how long it gets, I want to do another one where I just talk briefly about the concept of Galder and Galder chanting the runes, or and how runes and rune names might tie into that concept. I hope this video was informative or at least entertaining for you all. I just wanted to give a very brief history, but there are a multitude of sources out there, including Dr. Jackson Crawford, if you are looking for some hardcore in-depth historical background on the runes. I just wanted to mostly give some brief knowledge on that for you all and then yeah mostly talk about how we use them in divination today and the origins of that and next time i will talk more about how i actually use the runes personally in magic and spell work so until next time stay classy pagans